just speak in English and we've got dialects and we have accents, so if you don't understand us, put your hand up and we'll replay back what we said so you understand what we're saying. Other than that, yep. So um, I'm just going to introduce you quickly to what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the presentation is called Scaling Agility Across the Enterprise. Uh, it's a series of presentations, uh, so you'll have to come back to another one to see the rest of them. But the specific uh, focus of this presentation is the visibility and consistency uh, that we're going to be talking about today. So uh, just a quick introduction of who we are. I'm David Weir. I'm the head of development for Call Credit. Um, I've been with the company around about uh, a year. Previous to that, I uh, worked at a, uh, various financial institutions, been doing Agile for around about 10 years. Uh, so I'm Graham Fisher. I'm head of the program management office for Call Credit. I've been with Call Credit for ooh, a good year and a half now. Um, involved with David in terms of setting up Agile in the business. My, his, my background, um, I used to work for Virgin Media, Richard Branson's group, um, and also uh, the local government as well. Okay. So, a quick lowdown on what we're going to be talking about today. So, we're going to have a real quick overview of uh, Call Credit. Don't worry, it's not a sales pitch. I'm just trying to give you the context of uh, you know, why we chose a particular brand of Agile and what that means to us. Uh, we're going to talk about why we were forced to go down an Agile route, because what we were doing was unsustainable. We're going to do a bit of a deep dive into uh, scrum boards, Kanban boards, wiping boards, that kind of thing. Uh, try and highlight some of the, the you know, kind of common issues that people find with them. Some of the quick wins that we can, uh, we, we can kind of get to grips with straight away. And then we're going to have a bit of a practical example. So myself and Graeme are going to try and run through some of the, uh, the tips that we've, we've just discussed and spoke about. Um, and then we're going to actually get to the point and give you some tips on increasing the visibility across the enterprise. Like Graham said, we're going to try and leave the questions to the end, and we're going to try and keep this tight, so uh, we're going to make sure there's plenty of time uh, to ask some questions. If we don't, because this is agile and it's a bit flexible and fluid, <laughs> um, then we, we, we are hanging around for the rest of the day, so we'll be able to ask any questions then also. Uh, if you catch us. Okay, so how many of you know Call Credit or have heard of us now? Apart from you lot. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Great. Okay, so we're, we're starting to make an impact in, in Kaunas. That's great. Um, okay, um, so Call Credit, um, its headquarters is based in Leeds in the UK, in Northern England. Um, it has actually it's gone up to about 1,000 employees now, not 800 anymore. Um, we've got various locations in the UK. We have a, a little office in Japan. Um, we've got, obviously, our office now in Kaunas in the arena, um, which has capability of taking about 200 people. We've got roughly 40 to 50 people now in the, in the office, and that's growing on a weekly basis. Um, the business really works and, and, and makes its money from three sectors, really, the credit, marketing, and consumer areas. Um, credit and marketing being the big bits for us. Um, obviously, key, key points here. Um, for marketing, we deal, I do a lot of database work. We do a lot of um, mangling of data and... and, and compressing of data for our customers. Credit solutions is our biggest bit of the business. So uh, we process nearly over a, 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 yeah, about a million um, credit checks on a daily basis. Um, and we obviously do a lot of stuff in gaming sectors, uh, gambling, all that kind of stuff in terms of credit checking. Consumer markets, so we've just, over the last few months, released a product called Noddle in the UK, which allows UK public to have free access to their credit report, so we don't charge, we just give it for free. So the kind of things we do. Um, we're a very big, great, well, I say big, we're getting big. Um, we're growing at about 20, 25% a year. For the last four years, we've grown very consistently. Um, and we are owned, obviously, by uh, a Vitruvian, which is a capitalist. Yeah. Okay, so as, uh, as Graham touched on there, we've had tremendous growth over a really short period of time. Um, we've grown since our uh, inception in 2000, when we were uh, formally established. Uh, and then from that point onwards, we kind of started a, yeah, organic growth. We got better at what we were doing. We grew, and we uh, started to acquire companies. So you can see in 2003, we acquired EuroDirect and GMAP. Uh, in 2007, Legatio, Decision Metrics. Uh, and we kind of continued that trend. Even in uh, as, even as short time as last year, we acquired uh, three companies. So a lot of them names won't mean anything to you, um, and the, uh, the trading names that they, they continue to function under is largely being lost now because they're overarching uh, all part of core credit. 
so from core credit, buying a company or organic growth is very attractive because we are able to spearhead into a market uh, where we otherwise would have taken a long time uh, to build products or build a reputation in that area. Uh, nothing really to do with Agile, but it kind of presents a very uh, attractive proposition to the business. The problems that have from an operational point of view is every single company usually comes with a little IT department all on its own, yeah. and they've got different ways of working, usually they've got different ways of um, technologies that they develop in, different operational support, how often have you had scenarios where developers are actually managing the operational uh, activities. So all, all sorts of problems uh, are presented from growing at a speed which is uh, unsustainable and just acquiring companies without a bit more of a long-term thought. So in 2011, um, or as early back as 2010, we actually started to do a restructure, hence the reason myself and Graham have only been with the company a couple of years, because that was when a lot of the restructuring came about and new positions were created. Uh, we called it a target operating model. Uh, essentially, we're trying to build a lot of the, uh, the functions together so that uh, IT department, HR department, finance department weren't all separate within the separate companies. And whilst we were actually going under a restructure, we thought, sod it, we might as well <laughs> pull out a, a common methodology across the board. So Agile is the obvious candidate. We thought, um, right, which, which is the best uh, flavor of Agile to us? Uh, and we, we came across uh, DSDM, uh, which is headed up by a company in the UK called Turn. So I'm not going to talk too much about DSDM today. We're actually going to be focusing a bit more on some more techniques. But it's important to give a little bit of context about what DSDM is. And we're starting from an assumption that most of you know one flavor of Agile and other. So whether that's just generic Agile, XP, or Scrum. Um, and if you aren't familiar with Agile, then there was two presentations this morning where you should have learned. <laughs> so anyway, from a DSDM point of view, they are very, very similar to uh, the more commonly known Agile um, methodologies, so Scrum and XP. Uh, they are similar in the sense that they uh, use Moscow principles or they use the prioritized requirements. Uh, they are similar in the sense that they uh, use iterative development. In Scrum, you use terms like sprints. In DSDM, we use terms like time boxes. Uh, we have de separate states where uh, our project will um, exist within, so something like Enterprise RUP, it's uh, elaboration, and then it's construction, and um, the, uh, in, oh, I forgot what the last one is anyway. Uh, and then in DSDM, you have feasibility, foundation, engineering, uh, and uh, deployment. Now, exploration and engineering kind of go around in a circle. Uh, additional similarities to existing models, DSDM has no need for detailed requirements up front, and it's feature-driven. So there's fairly... Um, standard stuff whenever you're talking about any kind of agile uh, methodology. They all tend to have these, these running themes, and they're all derived from the agile manifesto written back in the 90s anyway. So it does differ in some aspects, though, and I'm just going to highlight some of the differences quickly. Um, a traditional method, or even um, likes of Scrum, use this kind of indefinite triangle where the uh, things that tend to be fixed is the features, and there's kind of a bit of flexibility in the, uh, the, the quality. And then you've got time and cross, which are generally variable. If things change, then the whole thing has to expand and contract accordingly. So if you're going to increase the amount of features, you have to increase the time and cost proportionally. Uh, DSDM follows a kind of more stricter route, where it has a fixed time and a fixed cost and a fixed quality. Uh, and the only thing that's variable are features. Uh, so there's arguments for or against using that approach, but the, uh, the main argument from a DSDM point of view is these are very, very business-friendly words. We chose DSDM because it's very, very friendly to the business, and it's not being installed in core credit uh, from technology forcing it on the rest of the business. It's been something that's been adopted from the top down. And the thing that people want to hear if you're a businessman is, I know exactly when I'm going to get something, and I know exactly how much it's going to cost. So if you're stuck in that situation, then you've got to realize that the only thing that else that's got to give is, is features. Uh, so the other things that are slightly different, and again, we're assuming that you kind of know uh, uh, 
at least some of the, some of the different agile techniques. If not, it's not that important for the, the, the kind of deep dive into the scrum wars we're going to do. But we have, these, uh, we have this concept of a project team, which is called the alien baby. And we have a head of the alien baby, and we have a body of the alien baby. Uh, in Scrum, they use terminologies like um, pig chicken and pigs. Uh, there's a good joke with that, but we'll tell you afterwards if you've not heard it. Uh, and and, and the, the roles are very, you know, relatively the same. Um, the head of the alien baby, just as with chickens in the Scrum methodology, are generally transient roles, they're not permanent members of the team, whereas the body of the alien baby, or in Scrum terminology, pigs, uh, they are permanent members, ring-fenced, they don't work on multiple projects or, or, or different activities throughout their working day. Uh, again, it's mainly down to terminology, what we would call a DSDM team lead, Scrum would call a Scrum master, business ambassador, product owner, business analyst. Uh, we, we have a specific business analyst in DSDM, whereas Scrum tends to just have developers uh, capturing the requirements direct or analyst developers. And again, it's, it's, it's just more of a list of, of, of differences and similarities. So hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll give you uh, the handouts later on so you can have a good read through and we'll be around at the end to, to answer more questions. So that was a very, very quick overview of Core Credit and DSDM. Um, and whilst DSDM, as I explained, is a, is a framework, it's a business framework, uh, it doesn't specifically advocate or recommend, well, specifically dictate that you use certain techniques, what we'd call agile engineering practices. Um, it, it recommends you find a mechanism to track progress, but it doesn't specifically say, oh, you must use Kanban boards or Scrum boards or, or uh, whiteboards. Um, but that's what we're going to focus on today because we find that scrum boards are fantastic. It provides all of the, uh, the achievables of what DSDM sets out a framework uh, for you to achieve. And, that, uh, and, uh, and the scrum boards that we're, we're going to talk about today, we don't want to sell the idea of scrum boards to you. We want to just give you some tips and some, uh, some common pitfalls. So, Scrum boards, we all know the great. If you've not come across them, we've got some examples in a, in a moment. But the, the main use of uh, Scrum boards or Kanban boards is to quickly get pro, uh, teams focused on what needs to be achieved in a certain period of time. So it's all around you know, getting the velocity right and making sure we can track things, making sure we're, we're, we're working on the right things, the things that are in the queue, not the things that are slightly arbitrary. Um, understanding what's blocked, so what do we need to, uh, what other things do we have to do to, to release that task so we can get on with it? Uh, how much time is left? Are we, uh, are we worried that we've, we've spent too long doing activities? So these are all good things that um, Kanban boards do very well, and the, uh, or Scrum boards, and they stop people having to be, build big elaborate Gantt charts or Microsoft projects. And so we all kind of agree that uh, whiteboards good. The one thing which I think is overlooked too often with whiteboards is that they're not just there for the team. They're actually, from a business point of view, they're far more important than that. They're actually uh, a shop window to your project. So you don't have to have anything to do with that project, but you should be able to look at that whiteboard and you should be able to see what's going on. How's that whiteboard, how's that project look from just looking at the whiteboard? And it generally there's a lot of telltale signs. If it's very messy, then you might have a project manager who's very agile. If it's, if it's uh, very laid out, then you might have someone who's doing agile under duress. Um, but when you're talking, uh, when you've got two or three projects running at the same time, then you need to actually have a couple of, you know, kind of consistencies. Uh, because otherwise, just one, one whiteboard starts to look like another, really, and it's, it's all a bit random. So here's, here's some examples of whiteboards from the internet that I grabbed. It like, looks like a fairly standard whiteboard to me. I, I, I kind of get what they're trying to do there with the, the different swim lanes. Uh, here's another one, perfectly legitimate. No reason why you should have separate colours and very, very regimented. Uh, nothing wrong with them swim lanes. And here's one which is just made out of cardboard and, and tape, which I think was very good. Very, uh, and they've got some envelopes where they drop things in and the burn down charts. Now, whiteboards should be 
individual to a project. Uh, that's part of the beauty of them being whiteboards and using sticky notes and, and writing with dry marker pens because that's, uh, that's how, you know, it should be individual to the project, should meet the project needs rather than actually follow some arbitrary set of rules. But if you take a look at our whiteboards, they're very unique and very, very standard towards, uh, you know, what the project wants to achieve. Here's another one. Completely different layout again. We've got a burn down chart on there. We've got different sections over here. Uh, quite a lot of different swim lanes. Uh, and here's a completely different one again. Uh, but hopefully you noticed that although all of our whiteboards are very individual towards the project, they've actually got a lot of consistency. They don't look that different from each other. Uh, although they are doing exactly what they... Uh, they need to. So these are what, this is one of our whiteboards, uh, and we think it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a reasonably well laid out whiteboard. It's got all the tasks there, which is, is going quite well, but um, I, I have no idea, unless I'm part of a member of that project, how well that project is going, or that time box is going. I mean, can any of you tell me any telltale signs with this perfectly good time box that we're saying we should, should be using? As, a non, as someone who's not a member of that team, how well that time box is going. <laughs> so I, uh, it looks very good, it looks very organized. But um, I suppose the, the first quick win I would suggest with any time box is if you have a consistent place where you put product or project information. You might want to put the start date, you might want to put the end date on it, things like a rag status, current stage they're at when, when the project is due, if you feel brave. <laughs> um, so if, if you've got a whiteboard here, and this, this looks like a good, you know, good time box, Nothing, you know, not, a lot of, not a lot of blockers on there I can see, uh, but it doesn't really make sense until you start seeing this kind of information in context, because um, if we were looking at this about three days ago, you'd be a bit worried because look at all of the things that are still yet to be done and still in the, in the time box and you haven't really got an awful lot done on the, on, on the right hand side. Whereas if you were looking at this and it was kind of the, the first or second of September, then it's a completely different scenario. The whole uh, the time box is, uh, it looks like it's progressing very well. So these things are time sensitive and they, you only understand the time sensitivity of these things when you know what the time period in which the time box or activities are being done. Otherwise, you're just arbitrarily just continuing to, uh, to, to move tasks from one side of the board to the other, and then as soon as things are dropping off the end, you start to actually push them back on again. A second quick win that we found, and again, I'm coming at this from the context of business members and visibility, not necessarily just for the team, is to have consistency in the way in which you manage some things. So you can have various different swim lanes. We've got a few different swim lanes here, pretty standard stuff in QA, done in progress. We've got queues there for completed stories. I think the, the real um, quick win for us that we found works really well with, uh, with the business is to identify an area where you can actually keep your stories separate from your tasks. So uh, for anyone that doesn't know uh, the breakdown of, of, of stories and tasks or epics is a story is generally a high level requirement or a, a feature within that, uh, within that time box. A task is something that a developer would kind of break down that story into subtasks. Uh, so for every story you may have four or five different tasks. The key thing is business people usually don't care or understand what them tasks mean. So when they're all scattered around the same places, the store is, a business person walking up to, the, to, 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 to a, a whiteboard would have no idea whether the, uh, you know, the story that they're particularly interested in is progressing well or if there's an issue or, or anything. So it's important to have you know, kind of some areas where you want to actually consistently keep things. Another quick win is colour coding. We like to uh, just keep a couple of standard colours uh, specific for the, uh, the different types of post-its that you might want to put on a Kanban board. So we use um, green ones for stories. 
So as, an as a business ambassador, I want to be able to so that writing stories is almost a presentation all on its own, so I'm not going to go <laughs> too much yeah. into that. Uh, a task which, as we said, is a, uh, a sub-item of a story. Uh, that's the specifics of you know, what the, the breakdown of how you need to achieve that story. And then we're getting to, to more of the key ones. A blocker and an issue. So it's important to us to colour code these things because blockers to us tend to mean this, prog this project or this time box is in trouble. It needs help. Mm. If we don't do something about this, uh, this particular blocker. We're actually asking for help from the outside world. So it's all that more important that it's clear that your whiteboards are easy to understand from business users who haven't been on Agile courses and may not be wholly bought into it, that they start to recognize that they need to be looking for stories on a board and they know where to look in a certain place and that when they see things uh, which are orange, they might want to have a look at it. I wander around um, our, our development departments, as does Graham, and we're kind of tuned in to the colour orange now. If we see something orange, we just kind of levitate, scour around and, 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 and yeah. have a look, see yeah. if it's something that we can unblock. Yeah. Um, so when we started to, to go down that, inf uh, down that route, uh, project managers found it was very easy to get the attention of a lot of you know, kind of senior people by putting a lot of <laughs> orange blockers all over the board. <laughs> Um, using it more of a, this is a reason why my project's late, this is why we're not delivering on time. Uh, so then we, we, we kind of created this other post-it called an issue. An issue is more of like a, an FYI for your information. We've got problems with these particular tasks or problems with these stories, but the project team is dealing with them. We're not asking for help, but it's kind of a, a that's, that's for your information. That's, yeah. It could turn into a blocker. Yep. It could be something completely unexpected, unknown has come across, and you just stick the issue on. You might have an operational issue, a live issue, that you just need to know about. No one's going to unblock that for you, but it's, it does affect the project. So how was, how was they then particular uh, post-it notes interact on a whiteboard? Well, consistent progression. So like we said, if we've got the stories at the top and we've got the tasks below, our, uh, our developers and project team are all focused on the bottom part and the business members are coming up to actually view how what progress is like or if there's particular issues that they need to be helping with. And what we get, if we, if we move progression of a particular uh, task, this one D2, we try to make sure that the, uh, the tasks have a correlation back to the original story so you don't lose uh, which tasks belong to which story just by using a simple uh, key code. But we try to move the story along with the tasks, um, but we ensure that the story only moves as fast as the slowest uh, task, uh, except for in progression. So once the first task is being uh, done in, uh, for any of the stories, then the story moves into progress because it's at least started and not until all tasks have moved through that particular swim lane will, a, uh, will the, the actual story move, move across. So, it's, and it's all done. So the next thing we're going to explain or go through is, is a bit more of a, a practical walkthrough. Uh, what we're going to do uh, we do have enough time. We're going to try and set a bit of a scenario for you, and we're going to use all the skills that we've just learned, uh, running a quick, a, quick, 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 a quick couple of projects uh, using these consistent quick tips uh, to achieve a couple of uh, set goals. So what is it we want to do? So there's a, there's a development conference in Southampton, which is in the UK, scheduled for uh, May the 4th. And uh, we've won the exclusive catering contact for this event, catering for, for food. Uh, so we all know what developers are called. So they're usually called code, code monkeys. Code monkeys, yep. And uh, code monkeys like bananas. <laughs> so we've decided we're going to transport two tons of bananas 
from Brazil to the event, and we must arrive via France so we can pay the minimum amount of stamp duty on import tax. That's our, that's our overarching theme, that's our program, that's our enterprise, that's what we're going to try to do. So we've got some non-functional requirements. The transport's got to arrive before May, makes sense. Uh, bananas will only last six weeks unrefrigerated, so we've got to make sure there's refrigeration units in the, in, in the boat that we, uh, we transport across. Southampton port isn't used for international trade at this moment in time, so we must upgrade our uh, navigational age. So what is it we're going to do? We're going to, we're going to run two projects. One's pretty simple. Uh, well, they're both pretty simple, really. <laughs> we're going to build a boat in Rio, and we're going to build a lighthouse. I'm going to build the boat. Graham's going to build a lighthouse. So before we do anything, we're good designers. We come from a development background, so... We, we, we flesh out a bit of a design, yeah. not, a, not a big design up front, <laughs> but we need two tons of bananas, so we've got to have a pretty big boat. We need somewhere for the crew to live, because uh, they're going to be travelling for quite some time. And we could do a whole series of um, you know, prioritisation of the requirements, but we're, we're not going to cover that off today. <laughs> so we've got a couple of uh, designs for the lighthouse. Because we know it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, kind of just with the traditional style, uh, but it's got to at least be able to uh, withstand all weathers. It needs to be visible in the daylight, and it needs to be visible uh, in the evening. And it should rotate, and if possible, it should be powered by the waves. That's that's kind of the overarching requirements. So we looked at this design, which is going to be really quick and simple to do. But the major flaw with this one is we wouldn't be able to see it in the day because it would just be so tiny and thin. So we thought about something like this, big sign. Uh, but again, in the evening it wouldn't really be very good and Last we're not Vegas. really quite sure how, um, you know, how much it would be able to withstand all weathers with it just being a big, uh, a big spoiler and all. So we decided to uh, opt for this design, which is just a traditional design, really, with a bit of a water wheel at the bottom so we could power, power the lighthouse. So again, we're very agile, but agile doesn't mean to say you throw away all the planning uh, <laughs> or documentation. I was paying attention before. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the plan, really quick plan. Right, we're going to build a boat in Rio in October. That's when the construction be begins. In November, Graham's going to start building the lighthouse in Southampton. In December, we're going to have a bit of a halfway checkpoint. We're going to look to where I've got up to, look to where uh, Graham's got up to, and then we're going to carry on with the construction. So that should go all the way through January through February. By March, I should have set off. By the end of March, the lighthouse should be finished. So there's a bit of contingency in there because it's going to take a while for that ship to, uh, to, to travel all, all the way across. So we can continue the build after that. In April, the 22nd of April specifically, <laughs> the boat is going to arrive at France. Bear, bear that in mind, the 22nd. And because we're going into France, so we're kind of using a little loophole in the European import market, <laughs> um, we pay less tax if we import things from, from France, from Brazil, because they've got trade, um, trade ties, and then we pay less tax by importing from France to the UK, because they've got trade ties. Um, however, we know that the, uh, the French ports don't release the boat until 4 a.m. the following morning, and it generally takes around about eight hours uh, for a boat to cross the English Channel. So we're expecting, expecting the boat to uh, be released from France at 4 a.m. We're expecting it to pass by, by the lighthouse around about 12 noon. And we're expecting the code monkeys to get their bananas 
by the 4th of May. So, should we build a boat? Off we go. So I've kind of prepared a bit of a whiteboard here, scrum board. Hold on a minute. And I'm uh, going to go through a, a really quick bit of a project. So uh, the, the one thing I can do as a bit of a business user is I can kind of put things in this queue. You kind of go, well, they're the ones I want you to focus on. So then wearing my other hat as a project team member, I'm then like kind of going, oh, well, we can get on with this, no problem. Uh, and we can get on with uh, building a platform. And I'll take the relevant uh, tasks that go with that. And they're in progress. So we want to build some struts, attach a wing, set up some, uh, some tool stations. Uh, and we're going to get the materials. So we're investigating the types of materials, get the quotes, and we're going to purchase some materials, uh, all of which is fine. So you can see how we're uh, progressing along. Uh, based on what day it is today, you can see, you know, kind of, would you expect that amount of progress to happen based on the, uh, the information that you've got here? And you've got a, a nice key here which tells you quite clearly uh, what the different post-its are, are standing for. So you can get so far along and, and you'd expect some of these things to end up going through the various stages um, and being in a, in a state of done, which gives you, a, as a project team, which gives you a fan fantastic sense of achievement because you start to really see what's being achieved. Um, but then occasionally you get a few issues or blockers. So we've got to, uh, we've got to the point here where we, uh, we need to, where are we at? Purchase the materials. So rather than being done, we're at this point here. Purchase the materials and arrange a delivery date. But we've got a bit of a blocker. The supplier's got a delay. So they're not going to be able to uh, provide us with the materials in two weeks like they promised. It's going to take three weeks. So is that really a blocker? Is there anyone I can actually ask for help? Is there anyone going to actually change that? Or is this just going to cause the likes of Graham or me to come in and go, how can I, how can I help this? I don't think it really is, because there's these kind of tasks here, you know, building the platform in which we're going to build the, uh, the, the boat on, that we can kind of get on with. So I dispute whether that's a, pro a blocker. Uh, that's, that's kind of what we say in the, uh, in the UK, that's crying wolf. What you've actually got is an issue. So we've got a problem with that particular task, but we're dealing with it. All the way, we can carry on building the struts, and they attach the winch, and set up the tool stations, have these moving along quite happily. And hopefully by that time, we'll get the materials, which will allow us to actually work on some of these other issues, like building the, uh, the port side and building the starboard side. And these are fairly standard things. For each of these, building the port side or the standard side, you might want to first cut the material, then shape it, then rivet it. When you've got similar sounding tasks, it's very easy to kind of go, oh, well, we've done that one. Well, which, cut the which, one was, which story was that again that I was related to? So we use these nice little hints here where this, was, this one says F1 next to it because it's the first task for story F. And we've got a little, um, a little thing here which says F on it. So we know that one's actually in progress, whereas uh, D... So C and E might not have started yet. So hopefully we get all the way along to here and all of my tasks are done and we get to the, the kind of halfway point. So this is my halfway checkpoint. As we said, we've built, built the left-hand side, the right-hand side, port starboard, built the aft, built the stern. We've set up the, the rig in there so that we can continue the building and we've obviously bought the material that we can... We can uh, Set it out with. So, hand over okay. to Graham. So, David started. I'm going to make a start. So, oh, good. Right, okay. So, same principles again. Mine's a little bit more, uh, a little bit not as flexible as David's in terms of building, because mine's pretty much sequential in terms of what I need to do. I've got to, uh, I've got to start with a location. So, yep, okay. I'm all right. I'm all good for that. We'll uh, put that one in the queue. And actually, I need to do a, a site survey. Great. I need to build, uh, okay, we'll move that one along actually because that's now in progress. 
Um, I need to purchase the land from the owner, so we'll start that off. I've got to build some foundations. I'm going to check access, make sure location's available for the deliveries for the, for the building, so that's going. And I'm going to start clearing the land. I'm going to start laying some stones, so I need to get some stone as well. And I'm going to start to obtain my lights for my house and the housing, so for the top of the lighthouse. I'm going to decide, okay, what kind of stone do I want? And the survey carries on and it goes through, so there and done. <coughs> so we've got uh, the location's good. Purchase land from owner, yeah, well, it's tough, he got, he got it bought off him, that's fine. And I've started to do some laying of the stones. I'll put that here, actually. Um, my, other, my final kind of task is, is my story is I've got to start building the structure. So my time box says by the end of my time box, I've got to have built the structure to at least half height, okay? Um, so I'm going to do some, take some bulbs. I need some light bulbs. Um, I need to check the availability of the stone types. I'm going to order some stone. Actually, you know, we're going to progress these a little bit quicker now. So we're going to say, okay, I've done, I've decided on the kind of light bulbs I want. I've decided on the stone. I've ordered the stone. I have uh, checked the availability of the stone as well. And then I'm going to say, oh, okay, I need to make sure I've got some cement then to go with my bricks and stones. I've started building my doors. We all need some stairs so the lighthouse man can get in. And as I mentioned earlier, I need to build it to a height of about 15 meters to start with in the first time box. Uh, I also need to order some bricks because obviously, you know, we're going to put the foundations in. So this is all about the foundations of the lighthouse. So I've ordered me bulbs. And I've requested glass. Okay. However, in uh, in the process of building my foundations and clearing the land, um, we run out of stone. We actually, you know, we we actually did the measurements for the foundations of the lighthouse at low tide. And actually, the tide's come in, and it's actually flooded over the top of the, the foundation. So we're thinking, oh, we're going to need some more stone to lift it up a bit. However, speaking with our supplier, the supplier says, I haven't got any more stone in a minute. We're going to have to order it in. So that becomes a bit of a, bit of a problem, that does, really. So I'm going to find my story, uh, get stone. I'm going to go, oh, we don't have enough stone there. What can we do about that? Because actually, that stops absolutely everything now from moving forward. I can't, I'm not like David where I can continue to do other stuff and work around it. That's pretty key, actually. I can't pull my lighthouse and have anything visible for him when he comes into the port. Okay, so we go and talk to another supplier. Well, so that becomes, a, that becomes a block. That becomes a block. And as we were saying before, I'm kind of tuned into the colour orange now, so I, I kind of spot this a mile off and say, well, I've got a supplier that you could probably uh, use. So we create another story. Create another story, yep. I go away, speak to my supplier and say, well, you know, maybe you could actually do it this one time, uh, and it gets resolved. So we actually uh, you know, manage to keep it. So then we, we kind of take that off and still that's an been dealt it's with. It's still an issue, but we're dealing with it. We've now got a new story that says, OK, I'm getting more stone. It's going to take four weeks now, but we'll still get some and we'll work with it. And in the next time box, we'll plan and factor in anything we've missed from this one. OK? Yep. That's right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on to um, you know, the, the, the second half of building the boat. Now we've had this, this, this checkpoint. Uh, the lighthouse, the halfway checkpoint for the lighthouse, we're not quite as far as we want it to be with the lighthouse. We kind of hope to get to the dotted lines, but you can see the majority of it is quite well done. So I'm going to just quickly rush through the, uh, the rest of the project. But one thing worth noting, because the business is all attention is on the, uh, the actual transportation and, and the, uh, the cargo, you tend to find that a lot of the money and a lot of the, uh, the, the more experienced people or, uh, you know, kind of higher quality uh, projects are managed by the, the higher quality or, or, or faster uh, teams. So I think it's fair to say that uh, the, the boat is, uh, has, has got a lot, of, a lot of finance and a lot of help for it, whereas the, uh, the, the lighthouse is a bit more considered a legacy uh, because it's built, got to build things sequentially and it's got to build the kind of old bricks and mortar style. However, because it is kind of bricks and mortar and constantly building, I suppose you could call it's got uh, continuous integration or it's got continuous deployment if you particularly want to <laughs> use them. So we're going to quickly go through where some of these other elements now. So we're going to, the next thing that you probably want to do if you're finishing off the boat, because we, uh, is we, we want to build the deck area and we want to uh, build the crew quarters. So they've got similar uh, kinds of uh, 
tasks that you'd expect from last time, very similar tasks to, to we had before. So I won't go too far through the, uh, the actual scenarios associated with building them particular elements and just hopefully uh, progress, progress them through. So the next thing that we probably want to focus on is the sales because we've not done anything with regards to building the sales yet. Um, so the first thing that we need to do when we're building the sails is build the booms. The booms are generally out of wood. Um, and then we've got to sew the sails together. Uh, but however, we've got a bit of an issue again. Uh, sail engineer is sick. So <laughs> this is a rather specialist guy who's expert at you know, working with sail material and making, making the, uh, the wind carry it quite far across. So um, it's not something easily that we're going to be able to get a contracting resource in. Uh, it's not a blocker at this point because you know, we're, we're, we're a very well financed project and we've got some experience so we should be able to find a solution around this. So the first thing I want to do is create a new story which essentially means I want to find some kind of alternative propulsion mechanism. So is there any kind of better better way of getting across the sea, do you reckon, than, than just the, the old kind of sail boat? Anybody? Engine? Good answer. I like that. I reckon we could do that. What a big, big outboard motor. <laughs> I, I reckon we could do that. I reckon if we put an outboard motor on it, I reckon it'd go twice as fast as if it wasn't using sails. I reckon we could do it in well under six weeks. <laughs> so we don't need that. <laughs> What's the point of refrigerating something that doesn't need to be refrigerated? We don't need to build the sails. Drop them. Let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of that. No longer an issue. Get them in dropped. Put them together. Don't need to do with any, anything to do more with the, uh, the gas exchanges. Don't need to do anything more with the refrigeration. Don't need to do anything more with building the sails because we've just gone out and bought a motor. All we've got to do is, is, is put it together. And you know what? Even better than that, we've delivered early. We've delivered features early. We've brought this project in a month early. We've brought this in in February. A full month early because we've delivered features early and we've dropped the right scope. Everyone knows that because I've, I've updated it. It's clear. And then we'll eventually get to the point where we can move things along. So I'm now finished. My project's delivered early. Nothing went wrong. Got a far better boat. Looks <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Results. <laughs> Over to you, Graham. Mr. Legacy. Right, OK. So uh, previously I'd had a problem, so that's fine. I've re -time boxed all my plan. I'm now going to carry on and... As far as I know, I'm still on target and I need to crack on, so, okay, I'm going to get me paint, I'm going to, uh, let's see what else I'll do, I shall uh, finish building my structure, I shall start to attach the lights, um, I think we'll start to complete, start to build up to the 30 metre mark, I'm going to make sure we start to look at waterproofing and sealing the building, um, oh, I think we'll choose some colours, quite like my colours, um, I'm going to order the amount of paint we need, take delivery of the paint as well, get that progressed, and I think I'm going to check, make sure that actually when we start building it, it's visible for quite a fair distance out to sea. I'm going to also take up some, start receiving the bulbs, and I'm going to start painting the lighthouse as a story, and we'll move some of this stuff along, so we start getting the paints done, and then we've got, uh, where's my paint, take delivery where, well, okay, that's good, that's all happened. And I'm going to start building my power supply, because obviously I'm going to make sure the lights are going to work. Um, I need to decide on my power, but I need to make sure what kind of power source do I want. So I need to make sure that's sorted. I'm going to complete my power source design. So that's done as well, and they're done. So I know what kind of power source and how I want to get the power to the bulbs. I'm going to start attaching the bulbs as well. So we received the bulbs. They've it's going done. quite well, yeah? Sorry? It's going quite well. Yeah, yeah, no, we're doing, we're doing really well, actually. Actually, we're, we're, we're well on target, and I'm going to meet you for whenever you're ready. In two weeks? Two weeks, absolutely. You're definitely going to be running in two weeks? Yeah. Based on, what, based on what I know, I'm going to be spot on. OK. You know we set off two weeks early, though. Pardon? And we're getting there two weeks faster than expected. Oh, sh OK. Fine. Um, 
Sugar. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, in that case, then, right. Shit. We're gonna have to drop that one. We're gonna drop. Uh, well, no, no. Actually, to be honest, I've got to paint it, guys. You're just not gonna see the damn thing. Uh, attach light bulbs to the building. Uh, yeah, no. Fuck it. Okay. Finish building structure. Uh, yeah, I've got to finish the building. I'm not interested about powering up now because he's gonna come in early. Um, that's all gone. Forget that. That's all bollocks. That's good. That's fine. And actually, uh, build lighthouse rotation. Nah, forget it. That's not gonna happen. Hook the power to lights. No, that's not going to happen either. Complete 30 meter mark. Yeah, I've got to make sure that actually happens and finishes. Order the paint. Yeah, well, I did that. That's fine. Waterproof seal. Yeah, it's got to be waterproof and seals. It's got to work. Check visibility range. No, forget it. If you haven't got binoculars, it's tough. Choose the colors. Yeah, well, I did that one. That's fine. Um, attach bulbs to fittings. No, that's not going to happen either. Right, OK. I reckon I've got a structure that will help you get in. So, I, I, you know, with a, with a little bit of following the rules, Oh, and a little bit of um, observation. Well. Following this DSDM practice, you know, we can make miracles happen. So uh, there's the completed lighthouse. Just in time. Not quite agile, but it's a just in time lighthouse. Quite nice. Painted quite vibrant, you know, kind of white and yellow. Didn't bother really with the, uh, the propulsion mechanism. <coughs> didn't bother with the, the water wheel because we didn't really need that. Uh, and we didn't bother with the light because. You know, it's, it light doesn't, doesn't, move. doesn't need to, doesn't need to rotate. A, light's just in a fixed, fixed position. The, fo the focus was, was, was get it complete, needs to be able to see Something it. visible, absolutely. So any guesses what really is going to happen? Because we've followed all the rules, remember, and we've followed our own tips as to how we can guarantee success through Agile. That's usually what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and there... Uh, this isn't called credit, by the way, honestly. <laughs> so what happened? Bit of a witch hunt now, so who's to blame? What, what's gone wrong? Who's, who's, who's sunk my boat? Well, the boat was twice as fast as it expected, and it, uh, it, it, was, it was finished early, therefore it was released from port early, and the lighthouse was, took a little bit of delay. Uh, because it was released early, we forgot about the daylight saving hours, so we lost an hour there. Because it was twice as fast, it only took four hours to actually cross this English Channel rather than three hours. Plus, you got the missing hour as well. So, by the time it actually got there, it was it was dark, and we'd concentrated all of our efforts on making sure that the lighthouse was big and visible yep. and clear in the daytime. Uh, and unbeknown, it was coming uh, in the dark. There's loads of other reasons why we could have avoided it. It was it was fairly obvious, and it was. Um, it's, it, it, it was exaggerated for effect. But generally, you can't blame uh, Graham. It's not his fault. Good stuff, thank you. It's definitely not my <coughs> fault. Each project exact, ex, well, behaved exactly how it should have. Uh, each project approached the delivery using many of the tried and tested uh, techniques, uh, including tracking the progress through the, uh, the boards. We, we certainly did a good job in turning it around quickly. Uh, it was, the problem, though, it was only doing right by the project, and it wasn't doing right by the program. Uh, very, very few people are ever make bad decisions based on all of the context. It's just you need to actually lift yourself up a couple of layers to spot the running themes which are really going to cause you trouble in the long run. Um, and there was no overarching ownership. No one, no one kept an eye on the goal. They were just focused on, I must build the boat, and my boat must be better. I'm competitive, yeah. and my have more money. My lighthouse was my lighthouse. Simple as. Exactly. Never the twain met. So fundamentally, each project was not concerned or visible to the other, despite their joint goals. No one was looking. So how can you avoid this? Well, you can avoid this by just you know, talking to each other. But you're right, there are always going to be constraints. We were building in Rio, you were building in the UK. Um, so there's always going to be the, the, you know, kind of too much of a reliance on customer or uh, user manual input if you're yeah. just relying on people to collaborate. Or, so what we have is we have something called the Scrum of Scrums. It's a 9.40 a.m. daily huddle, which contains every single PM uh, and any major stakeholders um, across the program enterprise. So you have technical uh, representation, you have program managers, uh, and you have various heads of departments, all there trying to understand uh, what, how, how are the projects moving along, how are they being tracked, is there anything that we can help with, is there anything that is actually changing that we need to be aware of. Uh, reports on the major issues and changes. We, we try to encourage project managers to update the Scrum of Scrums 
whilst we're holding the meeting, so you can spot changes right when people scrubs out a date and puts a new one in. <laughs> Usually it's the other way around, but in this instance it was uh, moving forward. And uh, we, try to, we try to ensure that there are people there, the attenders are there, people who can actually unblock issues. So if a project's running behind and they've not got enough uh, people because someone's been un you know, kind of unexpectedly sick, uh, that's something I, as a head of development, could probably do something about if I know another project isn't really uh, using, fully utilizing all of their staff. So how's that look like? Well, this, this is our Scrum of Scrum boards. Uh, it's, so we just, don't use post-it notes specifically. No, so just, co just covering down here on the left then, so we've got, as I mentioned earlier, we've got our credit consumer marketing divisions. So you've got swim lanes for each of those. And then they're all got represented by individual colors. And obviously you can see then the stage they're working through. So we've got foundation and feasibility at the left, exploration engineering in the middle, the big base, all the action. Uh, we then have a column that says one to two weeks prior to release. So that's just, you know, it's going to happen shortly. Then we've got a release column that says, right, we're, we're going live or we're deploying this week or in the you know, very near future. And then we've got the done and into warranty, into the, into the post project, yeah? Yeah. This follows a little <laughs> bit more of a Kanban approach, more so the, the, uh, the project board. So we have acceptance criteria. Uh, which allows things to actually come into each of these particular rounds. So these, these, uh, these are the blue tickets here on the bottom. So each of the blue tickets represents a requirement in, our, in order to pass along that swim lane. And we obviously observe the, the, the rules of Kanban board where we, you must move through all of the necessary swim lanes to actually get into the, the done column. Um, and equally, we, uh, we, we try to focus when we're actually, because it's only a 15 minute meeting, we try to follow the same kind of rules that we have uh, that you do have with the project board. So the, the standard, we don't follow a, what have you done today, what are, what are you going uh, to do, well, what did you do yesterday, what did you do today, any blockers or impediments. We don't follow that, but what we do try and concentrate on is, right, let's focus our attention on the right-hand side because they're the ones that are going to be coming and released very soon. So that's going to need more of our attention than these ones which are quite happily swimming. These might be far more complex and these might be simple, but they need our attention right now if we're going to you know, release or, or deliver early. Which ones are in a bad status? Which one have got orange things attached to it? Which ones have got uh, issues attached to it? And which ones have uh, got a rag status of uh, not green? So they're the ones that we focus our attention on. I just realised we've got a bloody Lithuanian word back in our... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, we're trying to learn Lithuanian words. Trying to learn Lithuanian as well, we're at it, yeah. One day at a time. <laughs> um, and so there's a little bit more focus there. So that's, that's, a, that's what a typical card might look like on a scrum of scrum boards. Uh, it gives you gives you a, a couple of more details, what the project is, who the project manager initials are. Uh, we use, use the, uh, these magnets, these handy magnets, for uh, demonstrating what the RAG status is. Uh, and then we literally try and uh, attach any of the issues or the blockers to the actual story card. Uh, so that's how we get around, not losing sight of the enterprise or the program, uh, especially when you're running multiple programs. Uh, while still maintaining a very agile and individual approach to all of our projects. Uh, and we do run approximately 25 concurrent projects at any point in time. Mm. So it, uh, it does work without having to overlay some uh, stringent rules and tight processes around it. So we've just about managed to finish within the hour. Uh, <laughs> so hopefully we can now open the, uh, the, the floor to some questions. Uh, anyone that we don't get a chance to answer because we have got just left five minutes, please uh, do come and see us afterwards. Yeah, so thanks again and please raise your hands now who has some questions for uh, uh, David and uh, Graham. We'll get to it, okay? Oh, good, it's pretty so, good then. <laughs> uh, do you have any software recommendations for the whiteboards? Yeah. Um, we've <laughs> consciously decided not to go right down a route of digital Kanban boards yet because we were introducing uh, Agile to a great number of people. A lot of us had got a lot of ex Agile experience in previous companies, myself, Graham, uh, some of the project managers. Uh, we wanted to, uh, there's a saying in the UK, we wanted to teach people to walk before they ran. Um, so we wanted to encourage making sure people used the actual physical action of moving the actual tasks and appreciates yeah, the reasons yeah. why yeah. we do it. I think it was also the fact that um, the ownership as well of those tickets as well. So yeah. one of the big things we've made sure all our guys do is actually own something, actually have a name against it and someone is actually taking responsibility for it. Yeah, and a, and a, and a second note is the reason we separate off the stories from the tasks 
is because at a later date, we can actually run the tasks digitally and keep just the stories. So you've got to remember, the, the, the whiteboard's not just for you. It's for, the, it's for other people to come and see how your project's doing. If you start to heavily rely on software that does it all for you, and it's very attractive as developers, you lose that shop window. And there's nothing more, nothing better to advertise a project than a, uh, a good old cheesy Physi camera Physi board. Physical board, yeah. The, with the wheels that don't actually work, but yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess the, the only thing others mentioned is that we are starting to look at Team Foundation 2012 at the moment. Yeah. And with just the infancy of plugging that in and then tying that together, and we are going to try that electronically. Um, it's probably towards the end of the year with our guys, with our colleagues in Lithuania as well. So we, we move away. At the minute, what we're doing, as you saw there, we, took, we take pictures on a daily basis of all our boards at a project level and at a program level, and then we share them on SharePoint so the guys in Lithuania can look at, it, at what, where we've got to that day. And obviously, because of the two-hour time difference in the morning, they can start stuff up quickly before we have the next meeting, basically. Um, with the electronic version, that'll probably become a little bit more easier for us to actually manage. But yeah, absolutely. We're moving towards Sorry. Team Foundation 2012. We have one more here. <clears throat> uh, thanks a lot for the presentation and uh, advising the physical boards because I, I have problems convincing people in Lithuania. Everyone, every software developer wants to use software. But then the question is how you track as managers from UK what the guys in Lithuania are doing. I mean, from, from yeah. management perspective, <laughs> we can play these you know, sticky notes and send you nice photos, but is it really true? Uh, we, we, as Graham said, we looked, we're looking at using TFS 2012 which has a fantastic um, digital Kanban board system to assist us in uh, actually moving the, some of the tasks through the steps because all of these tasks do get translated into TFS work items. That just happens, but we're not using TFS work items to measure and track our progress. We're still using physical boards. Until we've decided what Kanban board we wanted to use or what digital software we wanted to use, we decided to stick with the old-fashioned way. And as uh, Graham says, one person just goes around every evening and takes high-resolution photos of all of the different uh, Kanban boards and whiteboards. And uh, it works surprisingly well. Because it's high-resolution, because you can actually scroll in and actually view it, we're really struggling to justify completely changing again <laughs> by, uh, by, by what seems to such a... Such a good. I guess uh, some, of the, some of the core credit question. guys, some of the core credit guys are involved. You, you guys look at the pictures, don't you? And you use them quite often, so they're quite useful for you guys, yeah. Yeah. So actually, it works reasonably well. I mean, I, I, for us, uh, for us, it was very easy to use that to get us started, basically, because we, yeah. we only in, we only just got into the arena officially um, last week. We actually opened it officially, but we've only been in the arena for a couple of months now. Um, and with the guys that we've got in and the people that have come through the doors, it's easier just to get them a visible view physically. Um, the guys that come over to the UK, when they start with the business, they come and spend a month or so within the UK, so they acclimatize to how we work. They understand how the boards work, so when they go back, it's not something alien to them. Yeah? yeah. Any, any others? Okay, so uh, one short question, and uh, we can continue. Uh, does anybody has one short question for our speakers? Okay. Uh, I have one short, very qu short question. <laughs> yeah, okay, so for example, you have uh, virtual teams. I also understand you have uh, offices in the in, 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 uh, UK and in Lithuania. That's a similar question to Vidas. How, how do you manage the, then those Scrum boards? Yeah. How, how do we... Yeah, how do you share the information? Because you have one physical board in Lithuania, sure. for example. Yeah, yeah well, so we, take, we take photographs um, ev every evening, and that we share them over the internet via our SharePoint site. Okay. Um, we, we, we do have very, very low-tech communication methods. We don't we didn't invest in big uh, video conferencing. We've invested in uh, low-tech webcams. So that forces interaction with the project team. So you can actually say things uh, of a morning, can you just move this task along? All of our, um, all of our whiteboards live in uh, various places in, in the Leeds office. But we have uh, rooms dedicated for stand-ups, which have cameras, web cameras, and, and voice equipments there. It's very low-tech, very cheap, but it, it works in the ability to have a, a distributed huddle and have people in Leeds moving them for you, knowing that you have a, a very, very good record of all of the different days. So SharePoint automatically has yeah. the, the version history, so, so, uh, so it just and, works. And it's, and it's very simplest term. We're using Microsoft Office Communicator. We have stand-up screens in, in each location. So we've got a number of rooms in, in Lithuania, a number of rooms in Leeds, and the, and the huddles are between, yeah. between sites. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Sue. Nice. Thanks very much. Then, uh